thank you all for coming. I know there's tough competition to be here cooped up for maybe an hour, which we're delighted to have you here on such a beautiful day. But I think that um, it's an incredibly beautiful show. We're so honored to do this for Michael. And Michael has been basically shooting photographs for half a century, for over 50 years. And he never had a retrospective show, and not that this is a huge show because there's so many different bodies of work um, that we could show, but I think it's wonderful to be able to give his work the audience and the space and the large images so that people can get a real truer understanding of just what a remarkable photographer he is. Um, I want to start out by a quote by a different photographer because I think it will give you some sense of how to look at Michael's work. And Dorothea Lang, at the end of her life, she was one of the greatest humanists that uh, shot people suffering in the Dust Bowl and for the WPA did so much in the FSA to change the conditions of people in the rural south. And she was so emotionally, she, as a child, had polio. Um, when she was sick, she related to anybody that was suffering, anybody that was longing, anybody that needed anything. And she said, to live a visual life is an enormous undertaking, practically unattainable. I've only touched it. And when I look, the reason that I mention this is because when I look at Michael's work, Michael has led this truly, incredibly visual life. He never stops looking. He never stops shooting. He never stops wondering what the expressive power and capacity of photography can be. And as we go through the slideshow, we'll have Michael talk about the work, how he, you know, why he shot what he shot, and what we think makes the work special. And it's not chronological. <laughs> But one thinks of the Cuban pictures, um, which Mike was very famous for. Before that, there were the horse pictures. Then there were the American landscape pictures. Then during COVID, there's all these beautiful cyanotypes, which are leaves and the flora and fauna. And he, Michael never stops looking. He wears so many different hats and he shoots so much interesting material but there's a constant that runs through it. And I was trying to figure out what that constant was. We were having dinner last night, and Michael said to me, Holden, he said, when you think about it, and you think about my career, he said, really, it's all about beauty. So, but not necessarily in a traditional sense, but it's about a kind of beauty that somebody very skilled someone very resolved with the camera can quest for. And Michael's not only quested for it, but he's truly found it. So what I want to do is start with the work that people know the best, the Havana work, and how Michael talks about how it came about. Michael, can yeah. you hold the mic a little closer to your sure. mouth? Thank you. Better? Yeah. Um, and I didn't know what I was going to do when I went there. Uh, I was doing a lot of people, real people, uh, doing real things for commercial work, and I started there on the street, photographing women smoking cigars, photographing 50s cars, photographing... And I was driving down uh, the main embassy row, and there was a beautiful, beautiful mansion with a green vitrolite room with a gaping hole in it. And I went and stopped. The driver was stopped, got out, went to the front door and knocked on it and said, um, can I photograph in here? Can I take a look? Can I photograph? And the woman was Isabella, and she said, come on in. And that photograph of the laundry was done at that time. So that was the beginning of me thinking about interiors and the power of them and the, the, the vehicle to tell a story about the residents, about the country, about the time. And I, I, 
that changed my my world and the way I visualized things and the way I saw things. And also the color the, and the architecture, which I was photographing in my home city of St. Louis, which is a beautiful old city, decaying, but not, not decaying with this kind of beauty. Um, in 99, I had been doing color about half of my career. I had mostly been a black and white person. But this was a riot. This was like, like a you know, rainbow color that I, I just was. So, so that really, the green of this uh, interior, another a really good example, because it's about the color, but it's about the story. And I was looking at the photograph a second ago, and I noticed that one of the pillows was all crumped up. And I thought, that's the story. Somebody sits there. It's not a, a set. It's not, it's not, um, it's real. It's a real story about people who live in these spaces and about them. Um, I always find when I look at the work, something that separates, there's other architectural photographers, certainly. There's Polidori comes to mind, there's Candida Hoffer that comes to mind, there's Truth, there's Gursky. There's a whole sort of a German school that was specifically about architecture. But for Michael, when we call this, you know, the uh, textures and colors of time, for Michael, the architecture has to be very, very human. The scale, you can sense not just what a picture looks like, but if it's a great picture, you can get a sense of what it must feel like to be there. And I think Michael does that better than anyone else I know. Okay. Part of that is using available light and very dim. This is uh, actually pretty bright for some of these rooms right now here. Usually it's like a two or three or four minute exposure because they're so dim. But the truth of the light and the way it defines the space, the way it articulates the shapes, that's what, the, that's what these are about. And I think that I've always wanted the work to be intimate. Nothing of, of the photographers you mentioned, these are very small spaces compared to, to most of our people. Absolutely. So they're much more intimate in terms of uh, the human presence. Uh, and that's what, you know, it's funny. Um, I always feel like I'm making, I feel when I enter a space that somebody had just got out of that chair, that's why it's wrinkled, or somebody was about to enter, like a stage, a stage. There is a sort of term that you use in literary criticism as you, you know, went to a kind of PhD programs or a friend of those things, and one of the, one of the terms they give you is something called metonymy. And metonymy is in literature, um, in art, in photography, it's suggesting somebody's there by them not being there. Their presence as being there can be almost stronger when you see the sort of the ghost of the person in the, you know, sitting on the sitting on the couch, or you see someone's bed and the mattress is rumpled, and Michael sort of, or you see chairs facing each other where somebody obviously spent hours and hours with a couple sitting. And Michael's a master of that, that the pictures are very human and have a very human presence, but you don't, I can't recall any of the Cuban pictures that you actually see a person there. And I think if a person is there in a way, you read it in a much more literal way. You don't occupy the space as the same. When you occupy Michael's space, and Michael's always said he's looking for that narrative, you, it, the potential of anybody being there is, is not limited. So I think it has a much more stronger emotive response. I, I also think it gives the viewer a chance to add to the story, to interpret. The, the space according to who they are, which I like. It's a, I mean, that's what you really want out of art is to be able to reach somebody, but to reach in on their own, in their own world. Also, um, can you tell them a little bit about how the pictures were made? Obviously, you know these. In order to be mural-sized pictures, the negative has to be big. Michael was.
carrying around very heavy, clumsy, difficult equipment to use. And he said, last night we were talking, he said, you know, the film wasn't meant to be able to record this. This was an eighth of a second film that I pushed. And then in order in the dark room to get the colors to look exactly like they were looking, all of that's sort of a really difficult feat that very few photographers engage in. Uh, I, 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 I would say I'm a colorist who's a printmaker. I've always been a printmaker. I think even though photography is mechanical, there's still the hand is involved. And I've loved that part of it. I mean, I used to love, love to print. And um, digital was ter terrific. But, uh, when it came, everybody was running away from it, saying, no, that's we've got to be pure. But the only pure thing about it is I get a better print. And I have more control. And I'm able to, to render things that I wouldn't have been able to render. Uh, I remember when I did black and white, I would do, spend hours and hours making one print. And at the end, I'd have 10 or 12 or 15 prints on, the, on my table in the dark room, I look at them, there'd be one that was perfect. And there would be 20 that were just about there. And then if I had another print order, it was the same thing over again. Because you just didn't go and, and pull switch ones, five seconds, F8. It was, a, it was when digital came, when you got the file where you wanted it, you hit Command S, save. And then when you wanted to print again, you hit Command or you send it to the lab to get print made, and it was always exactly the same. So digitally, it gave me more tools and gave me repeatability, which is important because you want an addition to be the same. You want it to be all over the place. Okay, so again, as an example of sort of chairs of suggesting that someone was there. You don't know precisely who's there, but it makes, the, it makes you more comfortable, I think, spending time in front of your picture. And I think the scale of the pictures are really sort of important because the space that shown is really expensive. And I, you know, you kind of relate to it in a sort of big, altogether way. And I think with Michael's work, with a lot of photographers, there's a central focus. And then whatever, else happens in the picture doesn't seem to be very important. You just notice the, you know, the kind of the snap, the what, as you look closely, you notice the subject and you don't notice the rest. But with Michael, there's a sort of all over consistency that the entire photograph is interesting from top to bottom. They don't just have one basic focal point and that's the picture. So, can you talk about this picture? Because the, the beautiful thing is that it, not only do you get the, you know, the, the furniture that someone has just lived in, but you get this sort of trope that you love to use mirrors and doorways and spaces that open up so that the focal plane of the picture becomes much larger and the picture becomes more right now. Yeah, it's sort of bonus, bonus areas where you're seeing things in the picture, like the that one, the, the mirror over there. You're looking inside that mirror and there's a whole other world in there. So what you're trying to do is fill that rectangle with as much information so that the viewer can come back to it over and over and over again and find new new things. The more you can put in, I think, with, as long as you're formally composing in a way that's, that works, that the more information that you can that you can uh, offer, I think it's, it's important. So a lot of times it's trying to figure out, when a friend of mine and I went photographing, he was an amateur, and I said to him first, I am so jealous of you, and he goes, what? What are you jealous of? I said, everything you see you want to shoot. <laughs> I said, I've been doing this for so long, that I, I go, oh, I did that. Boy, I did that, boy, I did that. And I love that he, he did that, that he, that he could look at the world and so it was, it was, it was great to be able to continue to look and see new things because I kept challenging myself. I cannot make the same pictures over and over again because that's not why I got into this. I didn't get into this to 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 do the same photograph. I wanted to continue to grow as an artist, and if there's any achievement that I've been able to do, 
besides the fact that I've done it for 50 years, which is I'm, I'm very proud of. But it's the idea that I've, I haven't I've never been really sad. Not only successful, but never sad. Uh, I think what's interesting also about Michael's pictures is he encounters spaces that are interesting. He finds a way to make them his own, but he feels he can never manipulate anything within that space. No. That you have to find a way of working around what works or doesn't work in a composition. But Michael said it would be so easy when you, you know, when you design a room if you want to move the chair this way and you want to move the table quite this way and the picture slightly crooked and you want to straighten it out. All of these for Michael, almost as a street photographer days, none of that's allowed. No. I, I was in Seville and I was photographing in a Renaissance interior, beautiful, beautiful color, beautiful space. And against this, like, Renaissance table, I don't know, chest of drawers, whatever it was, and that it was an old golf bag full of old golf clubs. And they were, they were from the 50s, it was red, sort of ugly plastic, and really, and I said, oh, I have to move that. I have to move it. To this day, I regret moving that. <laughs> At the very least, I should have shot one first and then moved it. Because I always think that what's in the photograph, what's in the room, is why I was moved to shoot it. And it's a very complicated formula. And if you pull one little element out, thinking it's completely ins insignificant, everything is significant. Because it's why I saw it in the first place. And it's why the viewer, thanks to collective consciousness, saw the same thing. People come up to me all the time and say, I love this photograph because X, Y, Z, and I go, that's why I photographed it. And I, I, it's almost always the case. Uh, it, it's like a, there's a rules or laws of, of nature, of, of, of human thinking that are the same. We all see the thing very similarly. So I don't want to mess with what I saw because I don't want the message to be lost. You shoot a fair number. I don't think I have too many slides put in here because we're going to leave Cuba for a, in a minute and I think we're going to go to Europe. But um, there's a lot of stairways and staircases yeah. and that are almost architectural, but are kind of architectural. The way of Diebenkorn was, you know, if you were a painter, Diebenkorn would make things sort of architectural. Can you tell me what, you know, your attraction and, and what draws you to those compositions? I wanted to be an architect when I was like 18 years old in high school. And the, guy, the, uh, the advisor, the consul said, you ought to take a drafting course. I took it and in five minutes I was born. I, and my drawings were terrible. So, but architecture, for some reason, I mean, if, I, if, if, if they had a school where at, at 15 years old you could go visit an architect and see what they do and see what what it was about, I probably would be an architect, but I didn't. I think I'm interested in stairwells because they're when an architect gets an opportunity to be a sculptor. Yeah. It's a three-dimensional formal piece that actually can sit by itself in a, in a museum. They're, they're stunning. They can be stunning. And, and metaphorically, the idea of coming up a stairwell or going down a stairwell, it's a whole beginning to a lot of stories, you know. Uh, and I think I see that, the formal nature of it and the emotional potential of it, but and the else, beauty of it. But what else is interesting is there, there's obviously an architectural formal structure to the photographs, but the seduction and the, the subtle uses of color and how color changes through light is amazing. And it's in, it's in all the stairways you do. Yeah. Um, I, I, I don't know what it is about them. But and your career as a color, you know, it's really, you truly said yesterday, one of the interesting things with Michael for 50 years, being sort of top of his game, he said, my career is in color. Yeah. I'm a colorist. I think, I, I, I think chiefly that's what I am. What if you just boiled it down to one word? Yeah, I think in a picture like this, obviously the red against the black and and the sort of 
the frames and the architecture. I believe this is the piece that's at the Norton for the auction. Yes. So it's, it's an incredible picture. Reds are, reds are really hard to find in the world. And I'm, I'm, I'm in search of them now. And how did you get access to this room? Um, the person that I was, that was driving me around, uh, we drove by this space and she said, there's, there's that crazy Mercedes. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, she's got a really nice house, supposedly, but she's, she's nuts. She's local. <laughs> and I said, oh, well, I'm going to go over and say hello. And I talked to her. She was wonderful, wonderfully warm. We spent uh, a, a, a good half hour then, and then I went back and visited, and I photographed the space. There's three or four in the, in the portfolio from it. And um, she was uh, keeping the house standing just on sheer determination. She had no money. And when I left, the next time I came back, I thought the, the house was, the roof had finally fallen in. Which is really the story of youth. This sort of decay and, uh, and loss. Which is why it's, uh, you know, so resonates emotionally with us all. There's a, there's a sadness and there's a, yet a, a, a joy that these people are still living in these spaces. And looking well. A photographer, you know, one of the main tools photographers use is light. Because really, light is the basis of photography. The Greek word is um, drawing with light. So there's all different kinds of light treatments that Michael, some things are so, so dark that he said he has to push the film and leave the lens open, the uh, camera lens open for four minutes in order to burn in the color. And some things like this, do you see the colors that something will end up in a photograph when you actually see the slide, or is it a surprise? Both. I have an idea of what I hope it's going to be. You, you know, in this kind of thing, you're, what you're worried about is you're going to overexpose it and blow out all the highlights. And there's a lot of, so when you, when you make a print with the notion of keeping the highlights, it's technically very difficult to do. Um, digitally, it's that's another thing about digital. It's made it really, oh my God, it's, you know, there were things I wouldn't, I, I couldn't show because that didn't work out. But this was shot, the film? The film, yeah, film. That's yeah, pretty film. hard to get that light that way. Well, I, I, you know, I remember, I, I, I just kept waiting for the light. It was so bright, and at one point, the cloud must have gone over a little bit, and, and, and it darkened just enough to keep the uh, information in there. Okay, another stairway? Another stairwell, the, one of the first. Uh, uh, Budapest, I did two stairwells. <coughs> that, that was, again, just chugging along with a four by five and a big, big ass tripod on my back. And, you know, uh, three back surgeries later, I, I realized that maybe I should have used a smaller tripod. <laughs> but uh, I wanted it to be steady. I wanted it to be these old buildings. If somebody walked on the floor when you were shooting on a two minute exposure, it would be blurry because it would just give enough balance. It, um, but yeah, and this is com this was the first complex. Yes, it's complex. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a you know it took me years to get back to places like this. Uh, but we that's all I did is walk around. Gail and I walk around Budapest for day after day, opening doors and looking at courtyards. So it's sort of like an Easter egg hunt, you know. You keep looking under and around the corner. Trying to find something that's gonna, that's gonna pop. So. The nice thing is that documenting human spaces, there seems to be no kind of limit to the kind of spaces that you want to articulate in your photographs. I mean, that's this is really very formal and very very beautiful. Yeah, it's um, these these they were done in Sicily, uh, a really successful trip, which I haven't shown this work that much. Cuba always seems to butt in and take over. But I love this work. It's more intimate, more refined. Uh, some ways it's more beautiful. Uh, I was looking at this today, and I remember making the photograph, but I, and I remember looking, you asked me before, do I see what it's going to become when, as a print when I'm shooting it? I, I didn't realize how beautifully every one of those panels is like its own abstraction. And in some ways, that's what I'm doing now. Uh, and how did you keep yourself? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Reflected in that. That's tricky. 
Yeah, you, you're, you're down low or over to the right, or I think maybe the door on the right side was open just slightly. Um, I might have done it, I've done that before. I, I, I try not to retouch um, ever, because it's sort of like, you can only, you know, you, if you tell a little lie, if you're a liar, I don't want to do that. And the range from very, very calm to very, very quiet with that doorway with the kind of mystery, almost as an allegory. I, it's a strange space, there's no question about it, and I don't know why I made it. Sometimes you make photographs because you're there and, um, you know, you're eager to get some work made. You spent some money and time getting to this place. And sometimes things happen that, you know, I'm, at least I was not ready for, and yet I made the photograph and, and I'm glad I did. <coughs> And that's really sort of an interesting sort of intersection of different colors and lines and formality and informality. Yeah, I, I think <laughs> the walls and cities are like, there's one abstract expressionist painting after another. There's one collage after another. The surface of a city, what it tells about our that city, the civilization and the people in it. And um, this was in, uh, in Lisbon. And that city was just stunning in terms of the, the relationship of this old, elegant architecture. And these posters are up for a week and start to fall apart within a couple of days, and, and then they become like paint, like a like a collage. So, and it's, that's always been really important to me, collage and abstract, because I think some on some levels I'm I'm as much of a, f a painter as I am a photographer. In other words, I'm a photographer who uses a camera. I'm not a, a, a painter that takes pictures. Or maybe I'm a painter that takes pictures. But my head's in the, in the, in the painting, and that is that I can not. Well, this is those serious. That's also the system. This is beautiful. Those colors, the palettes. Yeah. No, it's, you walk in these rooms and they're completely dark because there's, you know, they want to try to protect them the best they can. And then when they pull the curtains, it's like, it's like, God, you know, the, the music starts. And, <laughs> and it's like ready to begin, it's showtime, you know. They just, the light in it is what brings life to the, to the photograph. And so this is really, you know, to me, this is totally a painter's eye. Yeah, this is um, uh, in, in, in Rome. Um, Anna Fendi's home. Uh, we were lucky enough to meet her um, because a friend of mine that was helping us had worked for her once and we went by. And this is the house that she grew up in with her sisters, her parents. A stunning, stunning space. And she was a stunning person. No, it's nice to see in so many different kinds of spaces from high to low respected. You truly, as a photographer, become sort of a cultural ambassador of respecting and understanding how people live. We, I think we're all the same, you know? We also have a sacred chair that's all wrinkled because you just got out of it. Um, and there's wear on one part of the floor because you're always sitting, walking there, and getting up from there. And those are the signs of life. Those are the, that's the portrait, that's the story. If we go back early, we go to the Badlands series. Badlands series were taken in a different kind of camera. We're taken out west. I mean, beautifully atmospheric. And again, you can not just see what's there, but you stand in front of the pictures and it, you sense emotively that you're in a place that's free and there's a kind of space around you that's a different space that, that, that doesn't clutter you. But this, um, this, uh, body of work now that Badlands is at the uh, um, name of the, I just did a, what's the name of the, like, Liagra. Liagra. Yeah, so this is hanging in Liagra showroom. They wanted to do a show in conjunction with our Miami and Basel, so we lent them the work because the work had also been during Venice Biennale in a uh, correspondent gallery. So Michael had a series of this American work it was in Italy during the Venice Biennial, and now it's in the Agra, and it's beautiful if you guys, if any of you happen to be going to Miami. The show is beautiful, too. 
but the work looks so elegant right there. Can you talk about the Badlands? A little bit. This one's interesting because you know, sometimes you, I drove by this thing. It was a, a hundred mile long valley, big old valley in Montana outside of Dillon. And I always wondered what that dark circle around it was. And I couldn't figure it out. I just, you know, just like, it was like, did it get scorched from something, some lightning bolt that hit the ground? Or, and then I showed it to somebody who lived there and they said, oh, that's where cattle get behind the building to use as a shelter from the wind and the storm. And as the storms change and come from different, they go to different parts of the building to shelter themselves. So I thought, here I am making a landscape with a whole story about this <laughs> and what it is. And this, this was a homesteader's home in the middle, I mean, literally 100 miles from anything else on this uh, old town. This was a period uh, after a fly fishing trip in Dillon, Montana, and we were finished for the day and my friends wanted to have a beer. And we sat outside and all of a sudden, I go, I gotta get my camera. I ran and I was got the camera, came back, set it up. And in 15 minutes, I made all, I made the next five photographs, I think they're all from that period. Just storm after storm came in, sun came out of the clouds. Uh, it was unbelievable. And uh, I thought, in some ways I thought, my God, landscape's so easy. And then I realized that this was a once in a lifetime moment. I never found skies or that dynamic of, landscape than I did over that over that 10, 15 minutes. But it's, you know, you have to be really unlucky almost all the time to be lucky once in a while. You're in the right And you were in Badlands. What what takes us to what part of your career? It was uh, 2006, somewhere in there I was working on a uh, Vanishing America series. In the Cuban work and the European work is probably from 2018 to 2024. Cuba is from two, 99 to 2014. And the Italian work is probably 2008 to 2018. So the Badlands comes first. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's landscape and it's out west. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's, it's, a, it's a stunning place. I mean, we're so so lucky to have this, this, this that west and untouched and, and protected. It's, it really is a gem. What's interesting is these are the same eyes that see into a picture and see what makes a great picture, and it's so completely different than the last two bodies of work, and it's kind of that kind of referencing a visual life where you never stop seeing or looking or imagining. I, it, I, would, I, I, would, I, I know Gail wishes I could turn it off, and every once in a while I wish I could turn it off by a key. And, but I was going to say, uh, the one thing that's similar between this, the proportion of the ground to the sky, um, those are the same things as every proportion in one of you. I mean, it's the same, there's less elements, but it's the same thought process. And, this one I shot with a, a square. Now, usually landscapes are done horizontally, called landscape before. But I thought, I thought when I did these, I think I use a square, maybe I use the hospital. That'd be kind of cool. And I realized at some point that I was making landscapes with bonus sky. So I got all this extra sky, and I, I, I had never seen landscapes done that way, but it made so much sense to me. And that's why a lot of times it's, the photos are also about the sky as much as they're about the landscape. Made in America comes. Yeah, this is a, just a series that I just had been making in St. Louis and decided to start traveling. This was the uh, New Orleans four months before Katrina. Uh, and this building actually made it through, but the water was up to that, up to the porch. Uh, the, the water lines went looking. But, but it was great. I mean, I realized that there was a, there was a story here that was fading, like in Europe and in Cuba. There was many, many similarities between the work. Um, and I, I, I was <laughs> done going back to Cuba because, again, I would be making the same book. Jesus here? Yeah, Jesus better donuts. I, mean, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. It wasn't open, so I don't think it was. But I'm 
I want to give Gail half credit for this because we were driving down a pretty bad street in St. Louis and she goes, you got to turn around. I said, what? Because I missed it. <laughs> so, thank you. Yeah, uh, you know, I think there's so, so much irony in this world, especially in 50s America, 60s America. And it, it, it just, you know, I, it's funny because a lot of times I don't think there's enough in the photograph. Because of Cuba, I have these really high demands. But a lot of times it's because I, I'm not willing to accept the simplicity and beauty of those images I made before. So these are things where I'm sort of just the leaves on the ground. I mean, I would never photograph that years, a few years before that. There was something about standing back shooting more, getting more, accepting that it's not as perfect as I was able There's to. There's also, you know, you become, you know, a hot shot with the camera in the beginning. And as you, as the world, you get awed by the world and it expands, you become more humble. So it's sort of the work of a kind of a more humble <coughs> honor. I think so. It's accepting, it's accepting things I can't control. It's, and it's a, and it's in a way uh, celebrated. And this kind of, the things that you, you know, you said at, at, you know, you said when we were talking, you said you look at Instagram, you look at social media, and everybody shows kind of modern, fancy, to the day, snappy, mm -hmm. like not real, very, very facade kind of architecture and construction. Then you said, we show America that's real, that's disappearing, that has backbone to it. And like it's mainstream. Yeah, and as it, it's just genuine, is a genuine and not a uh, kitsch. It's, it's like these are the real thing. This was a the sign for Time Magazine to do a cover on Mississippi River. And I went and shot it, and uh, I did get the cover, but it turns out it, 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 one thing the guy, art director, didn't tell me was it's got to be vertical. <laughs> so I made this photograph, which is one of my favorite photographs. And I sent it to him. I said, well, what about that? I said, dude, it's, it's a magazine. It's a vertical. <laughs> oh. <laughs> this, again, this kind of construction, I can actually point to Biden. Yeah, no, it's a uh, And imagine. the red. That, this is one of the first reds I found. Uh, whoa. Mercedes. And, and this is in the gallery now. Can you tell us a little bit about how you stumbled on the site and made the picture? We were driving, Gail and I were driving, uh, it was a road trip out west, this is California, Guadalupe, and I'm just driving along, and I saw that, that blue car, and I said, I can't photograph that. Um, what's his name? Uh, the guy that, Oh, um, Robert Frank. Robert Frank. Yeah. I said, I can't do that, Robert Frank already did it. And I thought, I, I, I argued with myself for about five seconds. No, 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 Frank, Frank, Frank did the one. Yeah, with the black and white. Yeah. 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 yeah, and so I said, oh, wow, it's so beautiful. And it's, it, it, it was interesting because I burnt that sky in digital. That is the sky. But it was when I just started to do uh, printing in Photoshop. So I would shoot 4 by 5 negative. I would scan it in high res bring it into Photoshop, and that's where I would do the printing. The color correcting, no retouching, color correcting, density, and stuff like that. And then I was trying to get that sky, because it was a beautiful sky, I remember, but it's blown out a little bit, and I wanted to burn it. And if you burn it in a conventional way, with your hand in a dark room, you wouldn't get that thing. So I actually went in really tightly and drew a sort of Selection that I could amass. Yeah, a mass that I could actually dark, dark into the sky. And that, this, that made this photograph, uh, as I said, it's a real sky. It's just I couldn't, I could, and I could print it, but I mean, you'd see it that I, where I burned it. Really, it's on the far wall. Yeah. It's, it's one of my favorite photos. Mm -hmm. And it's this is early. Right? This is 1984. And this was, this was the first photograph where chairs were, the chairs were important all the way through because people sit in them. And the viewer can picture themselves sitting. So it begins the narrative, it begins the story. Uh, and this was taken in 
Clayton, Missouri, where I grew up, and uh, next to the house of Wong, where I ate Chinese food all the time, and one day I walked in there and saw this in the afternoon, and I was like, oh, God, the color of the light. But it was so far ahead of me, where I was then, in terms of the, as an artist, a photographer, or anything. And, it, and, it, and it's, uh, it's, uh, it's still one of my favorite ones. I'm always surprised when I look at it. You don't think something that you yeah, then really is kind of old loves. Yeah. It's funny. Dancing girls? Dice girls, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Dice girls. I didn't know how to fix the crop this and I didn't know. I, I, I knew that I was on shaky ground in terms of what was appropriate. And so I figured, well, I'll, 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 maybe I'll just. Michael submitted to, you know, he's got a number of books in print. He's got huge, um, huge representation in museums, but he's also shot for like time and for life. So he's done assignments. So sometimes, yeah, you push the envelope and they say they don't want to offend anybody. No, I, 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 I was, I was careful before we had to. And again, studying right here. Absolutely. Yeah, you just don't see it much. <clears throat> it's such a stunning color. And where's this one? Then? That's in Memphis. It's, it's a it's a juke joint. I have about four photographs of it. Uh, so different American architecture. It's amazing because you know part of it's the product of the photographer, and part of it's largely you know what they can get in front of, what they what interesting material they can put in front of their lens. It's amazing. The recognition that it's a significant thing. Is America harder? Was it harder than? It's harder to find. We don't we don't tend to hang on to old things. Okay. And it's rare to find something that's intact like Cuba was. We we tear it down and make it up. We thought we chose some of the cyanotypes. Uh, America kind of went into lockdown with COVID, and an awful lot of photographers said, well, they just use that kind of time to go through their archives and to organize things and to clean their studios. But Michael, you know, who never stops looking and never wants to not have a project, said, what can I do in St. Louis during COVID? And this is what happened. So cyanotypes are the first kind of print. Uh, the blueprints are made, that, that's what a cyanotype. It's sun prints. You, put the, you mix the chemistry, you paint it on, and then you put objects on top of it, or in this case, I put negatives that I made digitally on top of it and expose it to the sun. And it burns out the, where the, the negative is, doesn't get the light, so it gets washed away. And when it dries, this is what you get. And all those edges around there, which don't be crazy as a photographer who's got those clean, sharp lines around the photo, these, these, markings were me putting the emulsion on. At some point, I realized that they were actually beautiful and that I loved them and that they showed process and they showed the, the hand of the artist. And so I started, uh, you know, and I saw, I saw it also, if you look at it carefully, they kind of look like trees in a landscape. So they sort of fit uh, thematically. But these were really a, a hoot because I would go out and photograph Forest Park in St. Louis is just one of the biggest city parks. Beautiful. And just shoot during the day and start making the negatives, preparing the paper, exposing them. So I did that all the way through COVID. So you're printing, for cyanotypes, you're printing instead of with silver salt, black and white, you're printing with, with iron salts. And iron is tagged by light, turns blue. But it's a whole learning process that Really, and then there, there were the early side, many policies, and no, send those back. My new ones are even better. Then another two or three months later, he said, oh no, you gotta see these ones. I have so the, it's the process of being excited, of learning, of pushing your eyes, of pushing the whole process of what can be done with great photography. And it's, it's, a, it's a good stuff too, because I, I, I just never let, I never waited. I always wanted to get mountains and learn from them and keep going. And that's why I kept sending them. Wow. They're really beautiful. I mean, you saw the number of them installed in 
We've seen them like installed in libraries and homes and dens and and it's in quiet spaces. They're really very, very beautiful because the color isn't as monochromatic as you think. There's a tremendous variety, tonal variety, and density within the pictures. And depending on how they're printed, how they're developed, what you put on the paper, you know you'll never get two pictures that look the same. The other thing I like about them is they're sort of ghost, ghost like. And I really like that sort of that sense of So that's sort of the range of the cyanotypes that were made yeah. during COVID. Yeah. Yeah. And urban luminosity came before that. I just thought it would be nice because it ties in very well to what Michael's doing now, which we'll be at in maybe five minutes. So can you tell me about these pictures? Well, I, lo I love architecture. I love city at nights. I love translucency. I love <laughs> reflections. I love color. I love so I went, uh, this was the uh, Gary in Seattle, I, I went to New York, I went to Tokyo, I went to Osaka, and photographed facades at night mostly. And it was about sort of painting of light, because again, it's really dark, but it's all about the reflection. And, and it was great because there was nobody on the street for me, you know. Sometimes I felt like, like going out and, uh, after a snow and there are no footsteps in me. I felt that way when I was out shooting these, because I knew nobody was outside shooting at 10 o'clock at night outside of COVID. How does this picture come about? It's a long exposure. It's in New York. It's a, a Bloomberg headquarters. It's a, a, a wall on, on the inside of a parking uh, entrance to the... To, to the colors were on the wall? Color were from other places. It's reflecting the color across like a down play of them. Yes. Like it's, it's, it's exactly like right. yeah, it's exactly So you don't, you don't, the eye doesn't see it, but the camera sees exactly. it. Exactly. Because you, 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 when you see it, it's just maybe dim little color or light. But when you do a long exposure, and all this stuff transforms itself into something that's visible. And that's a photographer's kind of ability through decades yeah. to actually see light. The it, way I can't, I don't see light that way. I see the light that's there. No, and you see the potential light and color there will be. Yeah, it, it, it doesn't cost much to take a picture of coming out. That's yeah. always been my theory. You know, if you're going to reject it, wait till you have it. Yeah. You know, don't reject it in your head before you shoot it. Because you learn so much more from the mistakes you make than the things that work. And they have a kind of abstractions. Yeah. They were, you know, they were sort of painted. I mean, this is me being a, a painter using a camera in the world. Uh, it's about brush strokes, the light, the composition, certainly, mm -hmm. the way light works. And seeing these things. I remember I was with uh, people walking in the space, coming up that escalator, and I turned around and said, holy cow, what? I said, that, you know, what? <laughs> Yeah, they go, go ahead, I'll meet you. They go ahead. <laughs> Three months later, I sent them the picture. And, oh, crap. <laughs> I get it. It's, it's great. It's, just, it's so cool to see something uh, and recognize it as something. You know, that's something special. Mm -hmm. And it's rare. But I, I'm always looking. I'm looking at the ground when I walk across the street, and I've seen some. Bird poops to the most beautiful line. <laughs> well, we don't have any of those for sale. So no. <laughs> How about this? This was on 57th Street. It was just cars going by wow. and reflections of whatever it was across the street. One of, the, one of my favorite things. All right. So this body of work now, which will open five or ten minutes, then open it up for questions and we'll let everybody get on with their day is the unseen, and this is what excites Michael now, and it's a completely different body of work. So, I'll let him tell you about it. So these are, I, I was at a friend's, uh, a photographer in New York, he was on a job, and he they rented a, a camera, a mirrorless 35 millimeter with a 40 megapixel pack, which means you can print pretty darn big, you can almost not that big, about that size. Um, and it's a beautiful camera, it's lightweight, I 
I don't need a tripod. And I'm starting to play with it. And I thought, wouldn't it be great to, to be able to take a camera, which I've never done. When I was, you know, in 72, when I started, I was shooting with an eight by 10 camera, black and white film, big, big camera. And walking around, it was cumbersome, and it was limiting, and it was limiting on what I tried and what I could get in front of. And so I thought, well, I've never been a beginner. I've never been that friend of mine I shot with and had, could shoot any of it. So this is the beginning. Uh, it started about six, seven months ago when I got that camera. And I started shooting in St. Louis because uh, we weren't traveling. I was getting over another back surgery. And so I started walking around with the camera and started seeing things that I had never seen before and would never have shot with a big camera because I had those pictures in my head of what I should be shooting. And these things are into storefronts, windows, with a reflection in the glass of what's behind you. So you're getting these two images superimposed on one another. Sometimes you have control of it, sometimes you don't. And it's just been a real door, it just opened a door for me in terms of looking at the world in ways that I hadn't looked at before. And it's, it's more and more I'm getting more and more images that work for me. Um, a, 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 you know, storefronts with reflections of a plant and a, a building behind you that merge together without me doing really anything. So Michael it was kind enough to sort of loop me in when he was very excited about them and sent me digital files. And having sold so much of the work that we've sold of Michael's, he said, well, what do you think? I'm going to do a show. I think that'd be great. He said, I'm so excited about these. And I thought about them. They've grown on me. And, and, and I talked to Michael and I said, Michael, they're subversive. And he said, in what sense? And I said, when we look at photographs, the photographs that we tend to like the best are photographs that resolve very quickly. It's a kind of a flight mechanism. That we make sense of them, we don't we understand them, and we like them if we relate to what's going on or something special in them. <coughs> Giving us photographs that are dense, that look unresolved, that make you work harder, to try to understand them pushes in a direction that a lot of people aren't comfortable in, but it asks you to use your eyes and your brain in a different capacity. And it's sort of, as, as I think about it, it's kind of a poetic thing for Michael to be doing because now he's using his, instead of shooting one surface, now he's looking beyond and looking for things that truly in space exist very different than they exist on photographic paper. Yeah, these are real. I mean, I, I, we can stand in front of this and it, it, it helps to have a rectangle <laughs> because otherwise you might not see what, what I've seen. And that's it. Is that enough? And some of them are really just abstractly really nice compositions. And they're really beautiful. But you can't, the nice thing is you can't go to it with a preconception of, well, this is what Michael Eastman does. You have to open up and understand that this is an artist that never stops looking and never stops thinking. And it's nice to be able to show work in process. I like that. Because, you know, you, you, you don't get a chance to do that much. So this felt like an opportunity to, to, to introduce this in a way. And it's changing. I mean, it, it changes every time I go out and shoot. And that is... Uh... So I can control all the 
sort of minds because of what it's a digital, it's a, I mean, it's a view camera, it's made to shoot out the made to shoot and keep things square. You don't see the, you know, like when you shoot a building and then it can converge. And so when digital uh, photography came in, the photographers were telling me, well, it's just not up to what film can do. And, I, and that was when it first came in. Yeah. Are you saying now that digital is past the yeah. film? Yeah. When I, um, I had, uh, I was ready to, to, uh, to go digital. I went on a shoot and all my cameras were stolen. Yeah. Everything I had. Everything. <laughs> and I thought, this is terrible. I wasn't sure. Uh -huh. And I said, well, maybe it's time to get a new camera. So I thought, well, I'll, get, I'll start looking at the digital. And I looked at the digital cameras and at that moment they were not there. And in the time I looked, a year and a half, they were there. And then, clumsy me, I got this camera. I started like it. Yeah, about six months to a year in, my tripod collapsed, went down on concrete. I was insured again. I got a new camera, and in that space, it went from being really good to being fantastic. Mm -hmm. And right now, it is better than film in every in every way. I didn't think I could be saying that. You know, you're worried about the contrast and the subtleties of things and, and the control that I have when I print is, is remarkable. So, yeah, in the beginning, it was iffy. Then it was sort of really close and then it was like, no contest. No, it's over. Yes. So, you know, your work evokes both narrative and emotion in, you know, in, in, in basically one frame. I guess my question is, do you remember, or does it, when you look back at these, do you remember the moment, why you took it, what was the emotion, and do you keep a journal? No, you don't. I, I remember how I felt. You do? I do. I remember walking and looking at it. I remember going, it was always do I want to take the puppy out, <laughs> pack it, you know, not drop it, and you know, all that sort of stress and all the work it took. I have to make that decision. So when when it's when I, I feel something like these, I go, oh, boy. You know, get back. I think we have enough light. You know, I'm going to shoot this every way I can. So yeah, I, I do remember. Um, and there are times when I made photographs I thought were terrible, and they, I was wrong. They're good. Mm -hmm. and at times I thought this is the greatest thing I ever made, and it was like mm -hmm. <laughs> not what I hoped for. So it's uh, it's like it's like baking. You're not sure until you really see it in the wall and go, oh, yeah, oh, that worked. Um, this may be sacrilegious, but do you ever shoot with an iPhone? Uh, all the time. That's where I do, that's where I do all my, my bird poop photos. <laughs> no, I think, I, I, I do think that, that, uh, that the, uh, I will have a show, hopefully, when the, phone gets good enough to do a decent sized print. I get, I'm printing my iPhone photos about 16, 20, maybe 18, 22, and it looks good. But it's going to get better and better and better. And I think the thing that's so great about it is it's, it's here. It's not in my car. It's, you know, it's always with you. And um, it's, uh, there's some, you know, it's so automatic I can't do anything to it. I can't select focus. I can't, there are a lot of things I can't, I can't make it too dark. I, there's a lot of things that I can do that I can't do with an iPhone. But the iPhone is always there. I always have a camera with me. And yeah, I love it. I also love the video. I love the slow motion camera. Shoot a lot of meditations in the water and things like that. It's great. It's just you're, you're always engaged because you have a with you. Other questions? Do you have any um, background in art in terms of composition? Because your composition is magnificent. Oh, thank you. Um, and color, you know, like there's so much information I think that comes across in your photographs that I wouldn't necessarily expect just if you had a photography background. Um, compositionally, I taught myself by when you first start 
sort of the rule was you shoot the full frame and you don't do anything, you learn on the full frame, you have no problem. And I said, I don't get that. Why do I have to do that? I said, what if, you know, I did a whole set of horizontal cityscapes early on that were about this tall and about that long. And the only way I was able to do that is on the back of an 8 by 10 I used black tape to tape where I wanted the frame. And I would always pull the tape off and then the next scene would come up and I'd take the tape out and do it again. And so I got to the, and then the other thing when I got the print done, I would take an old mat and I'd take a mat and cut it in half so I had two L's and I would put them on the print, move them an inch and a quarter inches until I found the frame. I knew where I you knew where the, where the frame was. So you just know this naturally. Well, it took a while to make it natural, but yeah. Okay. <laughs> but my friend, my friend, the beginner went out with him. He said, "We're in the same place. We're shooting the same thing. Why is your why is mine suck and yours is good?" <laughs> and I said, "I'm gonna put the frame." And that's all it is. All the pain there is is putting the frame, you know, finding the right spot. And it seems like a smart ass thing to say, but it's the truth. I just have to quickly tell you that um, a lot of photographers are either self-taught, afraid to sell their photographers, or frustrated painters. But Michael said early on, you know, it was a different world, and he was teaching himself early on to photograph things, and he got very frustrated. Something wasn't working, and you know, he was shooting black and white. And he said, "Well, I'll, I'll just call Ansel Adams, and I'll just ask him what, <laughs> what can I do? I'm having a problem here." And he said. Get rid of that rapid fixer, get the regular fixer, do this kind of education. And he, and he said, I don't know what else to tell you in St. Louis, because that's what he called me. Because I said, I might come from St. Louis. He said, what, what can I do for you in St. Louis? And he, he was so terrific, but can you imagine doing that now? Calling anybody and saying, hey, would you uh, tell me how you did that? Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, and just, just let me know how you lit that one shot, would you? <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, Holden, you mentioned uh, Michael does pictures where the, every part of the frame is important. And I'm, I'm thinking of color field painters. Mm -hmm. uh, me too. Who, when I see a lot of them. Yeah, who do these uh, sort of flat field, planar kind of images. And I'm wondering, were you conscious of that at all or have any interest in that genre? In, in terms of looking at it or doing yeah, it? Yeah, or no, being influenced by it. The oh, yeah. Field yeah, like absolutely. Morris, Lewis, yeah, oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I, I think that taught me as much as I did. Looking at the painters. I didn't, I, I didn't look at photographers as much because when I was starting, there weren't that many color photographers. I was, from 72 to 82, I did all black and white. 82 is when I started shooting color. And so it you know, opened it up for me, and I went to art, I went to art school. I just snuck in and watched uh, art history lectures on <laughs> contemporary painting, contemporary art. And I learned a lot about color and line and surface and texture. You know, I, I just thought of this right now is that the whole idea that the entire photograph is of interest and it's all in focus. I think helps create that kind of emotive response, that there's a stillness in the pictures, but it's almost like you can walk into the big ones because you see the entire composition. It isn't just a chair, it isn't just a mirror. It gives you room to kind of magically, kind of romantically, if you're, if you're a romantic, is to kind of walk in, almost like, you know, Jane Eyre or George Eliot would have, or Dickens, that there is so, so much a sense of what it feels like to be in that place, even though we'll never know because we're never there. We just have the photograph as an approximation. Scale helps. It, uh, you know, you, you, you can look at that photograph and, or that one, and you can see yourself sitting in that chair. It's big enough to feel like it's possible. And we're an hour into it, so, any more questions you can ask Michael? Oh yeah, one more question. One question. Okay. So you walk into a space in Cuba, you decide you want to take a shot. From that moment, how long did it take you to set up and actually 
photos, how many shots did you take? One or two. One or two. You take two. One, because it's, that's one I want. And two, because I don't think they screw it up in the lab. I want to go. <laughs> Very rarely do I shoot a lot of stuff. The other thing is that when I was traveling, you know, it's not like digital where, oh, I'll just put another card in. You know, it's sort of like you have a limited number of photos. And you're carrying them with them and you're finding, you know, I used to find you know, closets and basements of hotels to unload those film holders, <laughs> light sensitive, you know, negatives. And it was a pain. So I didn't have that many. I would take 200 sheets of film or 300 sheets of film and pray that I, it was enough. It was always a fear, which was great because everything meant something. You didn't say, oh, I'll just shoot this. Or, you, you said, well, is this worth it? You know, is, it is this worth it? One less sheet, one, le one, one less shot later. It, by the way, it never ran out. <laughs> it never ran out, so my worst fear never, uh, I should say, I, I probably, now today I'll run out. <laughs> Thank you all so much for sharing your time. Thank you. Have a great day.